Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sterling Free Church, our service this morning. It's great to have you here with us. A special welcome if you're visiting us or if you haven't been for a while. It's great to have you with us today to worship God. And it's strange, but I think we're getting used to it now, aren't we, this kind of format. So hopefully we'll be um, excited to get back to normal soon when everything falls into place. But nevertheless, it's great to be able to meet like this today so we can worship God together even though we are apart so it is a beautiful lovely sunny morning i hope it stays that way but if it doesn't it's not the end of the world um, but it's days like today where you really just can see how amazing creation is and how beautiful everything is and how everything fits together so amazingly and you just can't help but glorify god when you see the world as it is um, just the beauty of it and how amazing it is and what a gift it is for us as well that God has given us to live in and just makes us want to worship him all the more. So we're going to start, we're going to start uh, our service this morning by worshiping God singing Psalm 100, the old hundredth. We're going to go back to nice old Psalm today. So we're going to sing Psalm 100 to God's glory and praise. So let's spend some time in prayer uh, before the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, today we gather together as the church to proclaim and worship your holy name. You are glorious, Father. You are our rock. You are our fortress. You are our salvation. All your deeds are perfect and lovely. Everything you do is just and fair. You are faithful in all things and can do no wrong. How just and upright and holy you are. Your unfailing love towards those who love you is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. 
We pray today, Lord, that the whole world would fear and stand in awe of you today, that they would know your awesomeness, know your power, know your grace, your love, and your adoption. Father, in the beginning, you spoke and the world began. Everything appeared as you commanded through the power of your word. Lord, it's so amazing that it is you who did these amazing things, who wants to know us, who wants us to love you, who wants to get to know us as our Heavenly Father. What a privilege that truly is. Father, today we, we know that you are our inheritance, you are our hope. We thank you for your love, for your compassion. We thank you for keeping your covenant with us throughout the ages, even when we've been unfaithful. We thank you for making us your people. We thank you for the joy that it is to be counted as one of your children. Father, we uh, are so drawn to you today. We are so drawn to your faithful love, which endures forever. So, Father, as we gather here today to worship you, we ask that you would, that your ears would be attentive to our prayer, that we, our ears would be attentive to the word we hear from your scriptures. We ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us how to love you, how to adore you properly, how to be fulfilled with holiness. We pray that you would touch our hearts today and especially that you would reach out to those who do not show you reverence, who do not adore you, who do not love you, who do not know you. We pray that you would help them change, that you would help them to love you with all their hearts, with all their souls, with all their minds, and with all their strengths. We ask, Lord, that you would place in our hearts today a hunger and a thirst for your word, for your righteousness. Help us to be filled not with the things of the world, but from the things that come from you. Help us to feed on Christ, who is the bread of life. For we have said, whoever comes to him will not be hungry or thirsty, again. Father, we pray for all those we know and love struggling at this time, those who are dealing with the fallout from this virus pandemic, maybe those who have lost jobs, who are looking for a new employment, those who are still uncertain about what the future might bring, those who are maybe struggling mentally and physically from long periods of isolation and lockdown those who are mourning the sickness or the death of loved ones, those who are ill themselves and struggle from day to day. Lord, we pray that your peace would be on your children today, wherever they are, that they would know during this time of trial your perfect love, your perfect joy, which surpasses all understanding. May you help them and strengthen them. And if it be your will, grant them healing from whatever sickness ails them. Father, we thank you for the joyful news of new birth again. We're thankful for Thomas, for his coming in our lives and how much of a blessing he is. We thank you for the news as well of another baby born this week. We pray for uh, baby William, to Vicky and Chris, and we pray that you would bless him, bless that family as they adjust to life with another person. And we just pray that all the children of our church would grow to love and serve you as their parents do, that your covenant would fall on their hearts that they would grow to be good and faithful servants to you, our God, today. 
We pray for all those still on our front lines in the healthcare sector and the service sector as things go back to normal. We pray for protection from more outbreaks. We pray for the people in Aberdeen that the, the outbreak would be contained there and there wouldn't be need for drastic measures again. We pray for our whole country as we look to go back to some form of normality that you would protect those the most vulnerable of our society during this time. Father, we pray for our minister, Ian. We are thankful that he had some time away to be refreshed and renewed. And we pray that as he comes back to work that you would give him a renewed fervor, a renewed zeal for your work in this day and all of those gospel ministers serving you around our nation today who have had such difficult times trying to keep the church running without being able to meet. We're thankful that we have gotten through the worst of it and hopefully things will be on the up soon. So we pray that you would also raise up new workers to go into your harvest field. For although there are people serving you, the work is still great and the laborers are still few. We are thankful that new people have applied into the ministry. We ask that you would strengthen them and their families as they go through the start of their training. But we pray that more and more people would come forward, that the resources would be there to help train them, that your spirit would just lead the church in how we can serve you in, and serve your power and your glory in the years to come. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of all our sins today, that you would forgive us the sins of pride, our rebellion, our disobedience, our selfishness, our idolatry. Lord, we pray that you'd forgive us for sometimes worshiping you half-heartedly, not giving you our full attention. We ask you'd forgive us for anything we have done which has displeased you. Remind us, Lord, today of your grace. Remind us of those that we need to forgive too. Help us to forgive those who wrong us. And just help us to be filled with assurance that you are our Father and you love us and you will forgive us our sins. We are able to do this in the knowledge that Christ paid the price for our sins on the cross, knowing that he died as that perfect sacrifice which we could not provide for our sakes so that we could be counted as among your children. That is our hope, Lord. That is our assurance, not in anything that we say, not in anything that we do or think, but our hope is solely in Christ. So our prayer today would be that Christ would be at the centre of our lives in everything that we think and say and do, not just today on your day, but every day of every week, of every month, of every year, may Christ be our goal and our ending. It is his name that we pray to you today. Amen. So just a quick thing before we turn to our Bible reading this morning. Some of the younger people in the church may have received a little package yesterday with a few bits and bobs in it. I wonder, Millie Rose, Flynn, Charlotte, have you had a look at yours yet to see what's inside? Well, Claire is infinitely skilled in crafting and making crafty things. So she put together a little kit to help you make your own Queen Esther. So... What I want you to do is use all the little bits and bobs that are in your little bag, if you haven't done it already, and I want you to decorate your wooden spoon to look like Queen Esther. Now, Claire has done one already as an example. So I'll show you what she did, because she's very good. I'm not crafty at all. So this is Queen Esther in all her glory. See, there's her mighty crown and her beautiful robes and her smiley face. So you don't have to make it exactly like Claire's. You can you can go wild and do your own thing, but what if you can get your uh, parents or whoever to send me a picture of the finished thing, we'll put them up online so everyone can see your awesome crafty skills. Um, I won't do one because it'll look like some kind of abomination, but I'm sure yours will be beautiful. 
So let's now turn to God's word. We're going to read from the book of Esther again. We're going to continue our series and we're going to start. Uh, we're going to read from Esther, the end of Esther 6 and through to the end of chapter 7. So let me just get the words on the screen for you. There we go. So from Esther chapter 6 to the end of chapter 7. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Amen. And we ask God to bestow his blessing on the reading of his holy word to us this morning. So before we look at that passage together, uh, we're going to sing again to God's praise. This time we're going to sing from Psalm 46 to God's praise from the Sing Psalms version of Psalm 46. So let us sing together and lift our hearts in worship as we sing Psalm 46. God is our
Let's now turn to God's Word. If you have your Bibles, it'd be handy to have them open at the end of Esther 6 and going into Esther 7. So the title of our sermon today is A Plot Revealed and an Enemy Destroyed. I wonder if uh, growing up, when you were younger, perhaps you, uh, you might have watched Scooby-Doo, you know, the cartoon. I don't quite know why, but when I was reading through this passage in preparation for today, this passage brought those old Scooby-Doo cartoons to mind. You remember how they went, you know, the gang are off doing something together, and all of a sudden they encounter a ghost or a monster terrorizing someone or some place, and so they seek to investigate to find out what's going on. And you always remember the antics, especially of Shaggy and Scooby, who are great big scaredy cats and always end up running away and hiding. But eventually, after much hilarity, the gang would catch the monster and they would just pull off the mask to reveal it just to be a man or somebody underneath who is just scheming and plotting to try and get their own way somehow. And they always had that funny line at the end, didn't they? You know, I would have got away with it too if it hadn't been for you meddling kids. Yeah, those, those were the days. Cartoons were good back then. Pretty funny stuff. But this is kind of the way that this chapter plays out. This is Haman's unmasking and we see that pesky kid Esther is about to tear off his facade and reveal him for the evil man that he is. Because that's the first point we're going to look at this morning and that's Haman unmasked. So unlike previously in this book, the narrative structure here between chapter 6 and 7 does not put any break in time here it would seem that the events play out um, in sequence, one straight after the other. So when Haman is at home, just after honouring Mordecai, much to his distaste, he is then summoned by the king's servants who come to escort him to the queen's banquet. The whole point of Esther is that Esther has waited. She hasn't acted rashly. She waited until the right moment. She waited until the right time to reveal Haman's vile plot to the king. She could have said something when she first approached the king, but would she have been listened to? I'm not so sure. God had, it seemed, granted Esther extreme wisdom and extreme patience to tackle this matter properly not rushing into failure, but waiting until just the right moment to reveal the enemy. Before today, Haman was untouchable. He was right at the top of the king's government. No, none but save the king could have possibly done anything to him. He was very high in the king's favor. But now, maybe he's not so high as he once was. Maybe the king's focus has shifted and his favour is now upon Mordecai and Esther. You can see this in the way that the king addresses Esther. He doesn't just call her Esther or queen, but he uses her full title, Queen Esther, he says. Once again, he asks her for her wish. And this time she asks him for what she truly wants. Verse 3 of chapter 7 it says, the queen, then Queen Esther answered, if I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be king, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. 
for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Finally, after much waiting, Esther has revealed to the king exactly what is happening. But do you notice that she's very careful in the way that she speaks? Again, she's showing great God-given wisdom here. Esther words her answers around the words of the king, telling, her, telling him what her wish is and what her request is. She has very, very wisely crafted her response here. She hasn't rushed into anything. She also is very careful to word her response in such a way that does not implicate the king of any wrongdoing. Although surely he was guilty of some negligence and not really paying attention to what is going on in his own government. But because of his position, he was untouchable. You could not do anything to him. Esther's, dis dis Esther's diplomacy is highly commendable here. And again, it shows the wisdom of God in choosing her to be the queen at this point in history. But she also takes a great risk here. Finally, she reveals to the king that she is Jewish, that she, her life is now at risk because of this edict. And she reminds the king just of what the edict says by quoting it nearly word for word. She said, I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. She talks about her people being sold, and we might think this is a bit strange, but I think this is referring to the great sum of money that Haman promised the king he would receive if he signed the edict, probably from the looting and the seizing of the property of the Jews who would be killed. And again, Esther is very careful at choosing how she words her argument. She goes straight for the king's weakness in the way she pleads to him. She goes straight for his wallet. Her argument is that the king has been shortchanged. By annihilating her people, by destroying them, rather than simply selling them as slaves or something else, the king, whilst gaining a significant amount of wealth, will ultimately be losing out. The lost money from taxation, Another overall economic output would be much greater than what he would have gained in the short term. Now, to us, that might seem quite a crass argument. You know, we're talking about people's lives here. Why would we be bickering? Why would we be arguing about the economic impact? But we have to remember who she's talking to here. This is the emperor of the Persian empire. He probably doesn't care very much for the average person on the street for the Jewish nation. I imagine if she had appealed to his humanity, then he may have, her, her argument may have simply fallen flat and he wouldn't have bothered. But it's difficult to say one way or the other. But either way, she's very careful to stroke the king's ego in her plea, making sure that he is still held in high esteem and Haman is the true culprit. She, she tells the king that this attack is not simply against the Jewish people, but her as well. She makes it a personal attack against herself, the queen. She tells the king that this man is putting my life, the queen's life, in danger. And the queen currently has the king's favor. And the king is shocked by this revelation. Verse 5 of chapter 7 says, Then King Ahasuerus said, to Queen Esther, who is he, where is he, who has dared to do this? In the original Hebrew, the verb to say is repeated here. It literally says, King Ahasuerus said and said to Queen Esther. Possibly to indicate maybe some kind of stuttering from the king, you know, like you sometimes do when you're shocked and you just can't get the words out properly. Who has dared to do this despicable thing? Last week, we looked at the rather humorous exchange between Haman and the king, and we imagined how funny it would have been to see the look on Haman's face when he was told to honor Mordecai, his nemesis. But now, I can only imagine the horror that was slowly creeping into Haman's face as he realized what was happening at this banquet, as he realized that his fate was being sealed. 
And then Esther makes her killing blow. Verse 6, Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. And then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Finally, the moment we've been waiting for since chapter 4 has come. There is such boldness again from the queen. This, you know, unremarkable Jewish girl who was chosen from thousands of others to be queen has her time in the light here. She was chosen by God to save her people. But the question remains, what will the king do now? So that was our first point, Haman unmasked. And secondly, Haman falls. And the king is furious. I imagine he suddenly realizes that he has been manipulated in such a way and he just storms outside in his rage to try and calm down and gather his thoughts. He's been betrayed by his most trusted advisor, by a friend even. And it's now that Haman's world comes truly crashing down. At the end of chapter 6, his wife and friends had foreseen this downfall. That very morning, he had been right at the top. He had been, you know, just living the life of luxury, having all the power in the kingdom. He was planning to hang his nemesis. Everything, it seemed, was coming up roses for Haman. But now, later in that day, it appears he will now lose everything. He's gone from hero to zero in less than 24 hours. It's very possible that he had hoped that by attending this banquet, he would maybe restore some of his lost pride. I mean, after all, not everyone gets to dine with the royal couple. But when he hears these words from Esther, the text tells us that he was terrified. He has just angered one of the most powerful men in the ancient world. He is right to be filled with fear. Esther has now finally made her request, but we don't know right at that point how the king will respond. I imagine the tension in that room was so thick in the air that you could have cut it with a knife. Esther named Haman as the culprit, but remember, was he singularly to blame? It was really the king himself who allowed this law to progress, who allowed the edict to be proclaimed in the first place, so really both men are implicated. I think this is partially part of the reason why the king was angry. He was angry at himself. I'm sure that's happened to you at some point in your lives when you've done something or not done something, which maybe without realizing has caused suffering to others. And you do feel angry with yourself, angry with the choices you made, wishing you could go back and undo it. But also, remember, he was, a proud, he was a proud king. He might have also been trying to think of a way out of this. I mean, after all, he rather liked Haman, didn't he? They would drink together often. He was his top advisor. I'm sure he was quite a close friend. I'm sure the king did not want to put Haman to death. Would you want to execute your close friend? But there were also the particulars of the Persian law system. These laws, these edicts, were ir irreversible. They could not be annulled. So I'm sure the king was probably wondering how to get himself out of this mess without having to kill either Haman or his wife. So he's outside, pacing around the garden, trying to find a way out, trying to figure out what to do without losing face. We don't know how long the king took in the garden, but when he returns in verse 8, the dilemma is solved for him with an amazing providence of God, who again has stepped into the situation in a remarkable way to work towards saving his people. We read in verse 8, And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, 
And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Here you can see Haman basically digging his own grave. You see, the fashion at the time when feasting together was to recline on long couches. You've probably seen pictures of them doing this. So it would seem that Haman would almost be lying on top of Esther when the king returns, begging for his life. Again, you can contrast Haman with Mordecai here. Mordecai never begged for his life. And he never broke court etiquette in the way Haman is now. Now, it could be possible he was just on his knees before her, but the way the text says it seems to implicate he was probably more on top of her than just simply kneeling at her feet. Either way, the king's anger probably distorts what he's seeing. Maybe he even sees this as an opportunity. He sees Haman's begging for his life as a kind of sexual assault on the queen. Some commentators say even possibly an attempt at rape, although I think that's probably stretching it too far. Either way, God has given the king quite a neat little way out of his tricky situation. Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? By uttering these words, the king has sealed Haman's fate for good. Instantly, the king's men swoop in, grab Haman, and put a covering over his face. Covering the head of a prisoner who was condemned to death is a well-known custom, both in ancient times and more, more modern. It's something that's been around for a very long time. Haman must be dealt with, and now he can be dealt with for assaulting the queen. This keeps the king's reputation intact whilst solving the problem of what to do with Haman. Having dug his own grave, Haman has now put the nails in his own coffin. Notice now that Esther is silent. She's done the first part of her job. Now she just has to sit and wait until the time comes to complete her task in full. So we have Haman unmasked, Haman falls, and then thirdly, Haman finds justice. This part of our story ends on rather a dark note. Gone is the humorous exchange of chapter six. In verse nine, we read, Then Harbonner, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, and the king said, hang him on that. We see again just the barbaric nature of Haman. He not only wanted to kill Mordecai as if that wasn't bad enough, but he actually had those gallows built by his own house, maybe even in his own garden. So instead of getting up in the morning, enjoying the sunrise and seeing the birds in his garden, Haman wanted to get up in the morning and drink his coffee while gazing at the body of Mordecai impaled 75 feet up in the air. He was a very cruel person. And this cruelty probably didn't help him now. He had probably made many enemies in the court during his time. You were lording around his power and being cruel to those below him. Harbonner here might have been one of them. You can tell he probably didn't like the man by the speed in which he spoke to the king, telling him of the gallows. He tells the king about these gallows, the gallows that Haman built. Not only that, he tells the king that he built these gallows in order to hang Mordecai, the very same Mordecai that the king had just honored that morning for saving his life. Here's another, a, a, another nail in Haman's coffin. Whether intentionally or not, Haman had just told the king that, sorry, Harbonner had just told the king that Haman wanted to hang the, the very man that saved the king's life from an assassination attempt. This just enrages the king even more, and he orders that Haman be hung on the gallows immediately. This is one of the great irony of ironies, isn't it? 
You see, in the grand plan that God had, he needed those gallows. So God used the unrighteous intentions of a very wicked man to build them for him. And so accomplish his divine and holy will. We're told that he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And here we see that he who builds the gallows dies on the gallows. Esther 7 gives us several things to consider. Firstly, it gives us a very somber lesson about two different types of people, about those who live and those who die. It's a hard lesson about divine providence and the righteous and divine retribution on the wicked. Secondly, it tells us about blessing being given to the people of God and judgment against the people uh, on judgment on the people who are against God. Ultimately, the righteous will win, and thus ultimately the wicked will be destroyed. Even sometimes in our day when the opposite seems true. When God works in the life of the righteous, he is very skilled in what he does. In some ways, it's like watching a master carpenter build a beautiful cabinet. Or when you're watching Master Chef and you see the way they chop those vegetables and do everything so perfectly. To them, it seems effortless, but if we were to try it, we wouldn't manage. It's quite wonderful that we have these events recorded for us in the Bible for us to read about, so that we can see the hand of God working skillfully in the lives of his people and also in their enemies to see him work his purpose, to see him accomplish his goals. When you read through Esther, it's just obvious how God is working through this book. He makes what began as a very passive and very timid queen take charge of a situation. He makes a clueless king who just did whatever his advisors told him to do now become informed about what's happening and make a decision. He makes an enemy who was at the point of victory brought low and destroyed. And he does the same today. In our lives, when we look at the state that the world is in today, we may think that this is the worst time ever to be a Christian. But we cannot see God's hand at work. So we don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. Whatever does happen, though, we can be sure that God is working behind it all to his glory and for the good of his people. Though we might not see his hand at work, God is at work even in circumstances that seemed doomed. Haman's treachery here is nothing new. If you go back to the very beginning of history, the very beginning of the Bible, you can see the serpent has sought again and again to destroy God's people. But God honors his covenant. He preserves the lineage of his people. He preserves the seed of the woman so that we would have life through his death. There is a link in this story, I want to say, to the cross. Just think about the situation for a minute. The king has been angered. He is wrathful. Someone must pay the price. Haman is filled with terror and begs for his life. And once he is killed, once he is hung on the gallows, the king's wrath is abated. As long as Haman lived, the Jewish people were facing a death sentence. But with his death, the law is satisfied and the demands of justice are met. Although he was guilty of terrible crimes, the crime he was executed for was one he didn't commit. His death would set God's people free. This does sound very familiar, doesn't it, when you think about it that way? This is a foreshadowing of the cross, I think. It's an example of what we call propitiation, which is a big word. It's a big word in the Bible, which simply means 
the satisfaction of wrath by means of a sacrifice. This is the key principle of what the gospel is, because Jesus Christ was the propitiation for us. He faced the wrath of God on our behalf. He became our sacrifice so that we could be called children of God and be saved from our sins. Although unlike Haman, Jesus was altogether guiltless. He was without sin, without blemish, and his death was much worse than Haman's was. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. He was the only sacrifice that was sufficient to cover the sins of the world permanently. Interesting links there, isn't there? The terror that Haman experienced when he saw his time was up is the same terror that will be known by any who have plotted against God or rejected him in their lives. This reality should make those who know Christ hugely grateful for the gospel, through which even wickedness like Haman's can be fully and freely forgiven. Because in God's plan, Christ hung not on a gallows as Haman did, but on a cross, where the penalty for the sin of all who trust in him was fully paid. But it should make us sad also for those who do not yet know the peace of the gospel and who will one day be filled not with the same terror that Haman faced, but with much magnified terror, infinite terror, when they come before Almighty God in judgment, when it's too late to do anything about it. So we should give thanks for the gospel, but we should also be more determined to tell the truth of Jesus to as many people as we can in our life. We need to tell them of Christ, the Son of God, who gave up the glory of heaven for a short time to live as one of us, to live the perfect life that we could not, to make the atoning sacrifice for our sins that we could never hope to give, to die on a cross for our sake, to taste death for three days, then to rise again from the grave, achieving victory for God's people. I want us to show people the stories that the Bible gives us, stories like Esther's, not because of the human heroes that it tells us about, but because all these stories point us towards the main character. They point us to God and his plan to send his son, Jesus, to die for us. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Esther, and a reminder that you're always faithful to your people, that justice will be done, that the righteous will be uplifted, and the wicked will be thrown down. We pray that you would help us to be filled with joy for the gospel, but also with sadness for those who do not yet know it, and so be more determined to share it and to go out and evangelize to the people that we know and love, and even strangers, to tell them of who Jesus is and what he has done for them. Forgive us our many sins today, O Lord, and bless us the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to end our service this morning by singing the hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say.
So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, be with you now and forevermore. Amen.